marriage. And so as we are reminded about God's creation of man, we read this in chapter 2 of, of Genesis, um, verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now you are well aware, I am sure, that there are three, three options as far as the origins of humanity of mankind. Uh, one of the options that is given to us is what is called evolution, or they drop the T word off, but it still is an evolutionary theory because nobody was there except God at the beginning of creation, and so he's got to give to us his truth. The evolutionary theory is this idea that it's just a matter of time and chance and, and it's some primordial soup that was radiated that life began from that, and there are a lot of questions behind that. You do not have to um, be, you know, people say, well, if you, if you believe in the creation, which is the second option, uh, if you believe in creation, you're unscientific. No, you are not. Uh, we look at some of the great scientists who have lived and who are living today, who believe that it is six-day creation, that God created this world in six days, and, and there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of background to help us understand that that works that way. There are things that we can see through the evolutionary process that doesn't work. We are told, for example, second law of thermodynamics, that in a, within a closed system, everything maintains itself, it goes from order to disorder within a closed system. If there's nothing outside doing anything, it'll go from order to disorder. It will not reverse and go from disorder to order, which is what evolution teaches us. You see this evidenced in your homes. You can tidy up the living room. And within that system, you know, you're going to find that it's going to go from order to disorder. Your, your vehicle that you buy that, that's maybe new and, and all of that, it will go from order to disorder. It will begin to disintegrate. It just happens and, unless you maintain it. And so we understand that. So to say that creationism is unscientific is not true. In fact, Gregor Mendel, who's the father of genetics and worked on the peas and you know, did genetic lines back in about the mid-1800s. The only reason why he could deal with genetics was because there was an order that God had designed. And so we have two options. There's a third in the middle. The first, the first is evolution to say everything goes from, you know, it was just chance. And, and the fact that you're here as, as a human being, you're just lucky. But it gives no purpose to life. The other hand is that God created us and he designed us and he has a purpose behind it. And that purpose is that you and I, human beings, mankind, would have a relationship with the God of the universe. Then there's something in the middle, which is referred to as theistic evolution. And that is individuals who say, well, we think science teaches us that. But I also think the Bible teaches us parts of this. So we're going to call it theistic evolution, that God is in the process. He took, he took evolution and superintended it because it's an impossible thing. If you do any of the sciences, really, you've got to put your mind in neutral to make some really big jumps. And so it was the God, the designer, you know, that this intelligent design who, who made things happen. Dear friends, it's an attempt at a compromise, but it doesn't work, as we'll see. And so here in the text, what the text tells us, and we believe that the Bible is given to us to understand truth, it says that God himself formed man. The word that's used there for formed is the idea of being a potter. That God designed man. It's, this isn't theistic evolution. It, and it, where did he get it from? What did he do? He used the dust of the ground. It isn't mud, but it's, it's this idea of a damp mass of the finest earth. Those who would take theistic evolution would say, well, that's just a reference, metaphorical reference to previous animals, the Neanderthal, that God kind of designed. No, it said that he used the dust of the ground. He used that. And God breathed, after fashioning this, this man with, with clay and, and shaping a man, that God breathed into the nostrils of this, this sculptor, that, the, the sculpture that he had done, he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. Whatever it was had not been living previously. It took the breath of God within this, this created piece of clay to become a living being. And that's what it tells us. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. We are told elsewhere, and you've probably heard this at a 
memorial service at a graveside, dust to dust, earth to earth, that kind of thing. And it takes us back to Genesis chapter 2. Well, if, if the idea is we revert back to previous Neanderthal kinds of things, then, then we ought to revert back to that and not to dust. And so what we are being told here is that Adam was created by God. Adam, as a, a male human being, was designed by God. Not chance, which gives us meaning and purpose. Secondly, we move into the, the creation of Eve, the first woman, and we pick it up there beginning in verse 15. I'm not going to read all of the verses because we're going to jump. Actually, starts in verse 8 and goes down to about verse 14 that Adam is given a job to do, and that is to superintend the garden that God had created. He was to be God's vice regent. He was to be God's steward, and we still have responsibilities to be stewards of God's resources, they're to be used for us, but they're not to be abused. They don't belong to us. They belong to God. And so then we pick it up in verse 14, uh, verse, excuse me, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it, to oversee it. This is God's, this is God's property. And verse 16, the Lord commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat from the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. Why did God do that? Because God wasn't interested in robots. He wanted individuals who would choose to love him and obey him and walk with him. And it was only one tree. Everything else is for you. And you remember the story when you get to Genesis 3, it's the fall. And I don't, you know, it's built within us now. Much of it now today is a sin nature, but Adam didn't have a sin nature at this point in time. But we know how that works, don't we? Do not sit on this bench, wet paint. I wonder if it really is. Do not walk on the grass. You walk anywhere, but no, oh, let's see if it really is. Now we have a sin nature within us, but there, there's that aspect to us. And God said, look, Adam, I, I've given you everything, everything for you to enjoy. We could go down a rabbit trail on what happened there, but we don't have time this morning in Genesis 3. And so God gave him rulership, but he did put a parameter, just one, one small parameter. Everything else is yours except for this. Verse 18, the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. Interesting, it's God who makes that observation. It's not good for this man to be the, alone. This is the first time that God says it's not good in his creation. Day one, he, you know, me, evening and morning were the first day and it was good. Evening and morning were the second day and it was good. Evening and morning were the third day and it was good. It goes all the way through that. And this is the first time, this is day six, of creation, and God says it's not good for man to be alone. Now, think about it. Adam is in the perfect environment. He has the perfect boss. He's got the perfect job description. And yet it's not good for Adam to be alone. So what does God do? Well, look what he does. He says in verse 19, uh, you know, God had formed out the, the, every beast out of the field, uh, birds, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and whatever man called him. So, so God gave Adam the assignment. Let me go down to verse 20. And God gave names to all the cattle, the birds of the sky, every beast of the field. For Adam there was no found a help or suitable for him. So what God does is he gives instruction. He gives a job assignment to Adam. He said, I want you to go through and, and, and name all of these animals, according classify them according to what you see which tells us that Adam was an intelligent being. He wasn't a Neanderthal. He was an intelligent being who could go through and categorize these animals based upon the fact of, of what they look like. And the reason, as we understand it, that God did that was be, so that Adam could see that there, all the other animals, or maybe I should say all animals, because I'm not trying to put Adam in that category, all animals, there was a male and a female. There was a compliment. But you see, it says, but last part of verse 20, but for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. Adam was awakened to the fact 
that were male and female, they were pairs of every of other of animals, but none of them corresponded to him. Not even a golden retriever, sorry. There was nothing that complimented, no one that complimented him. Notice what God says. And so God says, so he's going to put Adam to sleep and create Eve. Why does, why does he do that? It's based on companionship. There is no one suitable for him. He needs a companion. God knew that. Adam needed to find that out. And he did by way of God's assignment. And so the purpose of marriage is not primarily children, although that is to be a product of, you know, be fruitful, multiply, etc. doesn't mean you have to have kids, but, but that is to happen within the, those, those contexts. But the purpose of marriage is companionship. So now if you were asked on a quiz program, what's the purpose of marriage? It's because Adam was alone and God said, I'm going to create, I'm going to create a helper. I'm going to create a helper. By the way, that is not a derogatory term. It doesn't mean servant. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, housekeeper. It's someone who compliments him. In fact, in the Bible, God is referred to as being our helper. So it's not a negative term at all. It's not demeaning. And notice in verse 18, it says, I'm going to do, make him one suitable for him, one that is matched for Adam. Complimentary but not the same. Adam was perfectly created, but he was incomplete. And so the purpose of marriage is what? Let's try that again. Purpose of marriage is what? Thank you. We were often taught as educators that a teacher hasn't taught until a student has learned. So so I want to make sure when you walk away from this this morning, you understand the purpose of marriage is companionship. It isn't to make you feel good. It's companionship. A little side note, I don't know if you've noticed, if you go, we've had, uh, Pam's had a birthday recently, and we had our, our anniversary first, and then, and then birthday here in, in August, and so you, you know, you know, go buy a card, you go through that effort, and, and, I don't mean in a negative way. Go do the right thing. Go do the right thing. All right? Um, and, and so I walk in, and I'm in Hallmark, and I'm looking down through the list of these cards. And you know what the most of them are saying? I love the way you make me feel. It's like, wait a minute. That puts the emphasis on me. Look at what you have done for me. I did find one. I put a little note on it at Hallmark. told Pam, go to third row down in, in the Hallmark. You'll find it there. No, I, I bought her one. I did buy her one. But I found it really interesting that the vast majority of those cards, whether it was birthday cards or anniversary cards, focused on, you make me feel good. There's companionship. Suitable. And a wife, by the way, uh, in Proverbs, tells us that a wife is a gift from the Lord. She's God's gift to you, gentlemen. Because in this context, again, it doesn't mean everybody is to get married, but those who choose to get married, those who feel God is calling them to get married, a wife is God's gift to you. I read a story uh, some time ago about a husband who had recently, they'd recently had, he and his wife had recently had a child, and he'd been to a, a service something like this and been reminded that you know, the, his wife was a gift to him. And so on Monday after work, he decided that he was going to stop by the florist and uh, purchase some, some flowers for her because he just wanted to show her that, that he really considered her to be a real gift to him. And so after work, he stops by and, and uh, purchases the flowers and, and um, he's got them behind his back and he's got this feeling that he just, you know, he's going to be, this is going to be a real encouragement to her that I was really thinking about her and so he opens the door and he hands, holds out the flowers to her and she bursts into tears. And he's thinking, that's not exactly how I thought, saw, you know, saw this going in my mind. And, and through the sobs, he says, so, so what's wrong? And she says, well, she said, it's been a really terrible day. 
She said, first off, the washing machine overflowed, and I got all of that water cleaned up, and the baby's been sick all day. And I've been cleaning up from this infant all day, and, and now you walk through the door drunk. So don't make it that much of a surprise. <laughs> a wife is a gift from the Lord. So Adam names animals. We saw that in 19 and 20. No suitable uh, an, uh, helper for him. No animal that corresponded to him. And then we see the creation of Eve in verses 21 through 23. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. He slept. Then he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at that place. So God performs the first uh, surgery, puts Adam to sleep, anesthesia, takes, takes a hunk of flesh. That's really what the word means. Takes a hunk of flesh out of his side. Now, we, I think metaphorically there, there are some, there's some teaching behind that. He doesn't take it out of the foot of Adam, that Adam is to be over and in control of and she is to be underfoot. Nor does he take it out of, her head, uh, out of his head where she is to rule over him, but takes it out of his side, place closest to his heart. This is God's gift. And so he grabs a hunk of flesh out of the side of Adam, and he closes that place up. Now remember, this is all happening on day six. That's been one of the, got to be one of the quickest healings, right, you know? Uh, that, that's taken place because Adam, Adam wakes up. And the Lord God, verse 22, and the Lord God fashioned into a woman the, the rib in which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. It's a, it's a different word than the one that was used of forming the man back in verse 7. The word could be translate built. That God built a woman. It implies beauty. It implies intentionality. That God, in his grace and mercy, is preparing a gift for Adam to give to him. And then we read that God brought her to the man. God brings Eve to the man. So what we have is man, woman, and God. Man, that... Man, a woman, and God. That's what forms the strong marriage. Man, woman, and God. And perhaps you've often seen this illustration that if a husband is moving toward God, and if a wife is moving toward God, they're going to be moving toward each other. It's a pyramid. And the closer you move toward God, the closer you move toward each other. And so that's what we see being exemplified here that that God has fashioned a woman. And look at verse 23. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones. This, this is different from any of the animals that he has experienced. This is, he understood that God had made her. And this is now flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And the reference that we have in verse 23 is that Adam is euphoric. We would say, yes, at last. Finally, there's someone who has been designed for me. It's the first recorded words that we have of Adam in the Bible. His response is understanding of what God has done. And he recognizes Eve's similarity. She shall be called woman. The, man, the word for man is ish. The word for woman is ish, ish, isha. So there's a connection there. Adam is saying, she is connected to me. She is now part of what I was. So he recognizes the similarity. And then God gives to us four principles for marriage found in verses 24 and 25. And so whether you're married or whether you're contemplating marriage, these are things that you need to know and be, understand as to whether or not you're going to be able to handle them. And so we read in verse 24, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall cleave or cling to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and, and were not ashamed. 
So what do we see? First of all, we see that there's a primary relationship. The first principle is that there is a primary relationship that uh, a man is to leave father and mother and also a woman is to leave father and mother. And that's fascinating because Adam didn't have a father and a mother. So these are principles that are being given to us in order to, to know how to live life. There's a severance because there's a primary relationship that must be here. Leave father and mother. That isn't necessarily dealing with physical distance. You can live next door and still have left. Now, it doesn't matter. You don't dishonor parents, but this is now the primary relationship that you have. Some years ago, there was a movie that was, uh, it's a secular movie. It's not a Christian movie that came out. Maybe some of you have seen it. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't. You can figure that out uh, on your own. But it was called Failure to Launch. And in it, as I recall, it was a 30-something-year-old guy who was still living at home because he was tied to mom's apron strings. He could not let go of mom's apron strings and vice versa. She could not let go of him. And so there are a number of different uh, relationships that he's in and out of. And as I recall, you know, he finally... He finally finds the right one, and they live ha happily ever after, I guess. Uh, but, but a part in there that I, I found really fascinating was the interaction between the husband and the wife when they're having the dialogue, and she says, you know, why, why, as a husband, is that, why are you afraid to, to let go of the apron strings? And the wife's response was because, I don't know if you'll still love me. I mean, it's, that's a rough interpretation. I don't know if you'll still love me. I, I don't know if you know who I am. There's been so much time and focus placed on the kids that there was a failure to build a marriage relationship. It's one of the reasons why we read statistically what is being referred to as the gray divorce. People who move into 50s, et cetera, after they launch their kids and they realize we haven't built a foundation we have been so invested, oftentimes it's dad in work and mom at home, or it might be vice versa, that they haven't been working on their own relationship. And so there's been that failure. I read a quote that I think is instructive. A child-centered home leads to a self-centered child. A child-centered home leads to a self-centered child that the primary responsibility of a husband and a wife are to each other. And so parents, what you are doing as you raise your children, you are preparing them to be independent. You are preparing them to be on their own. You are preparing them to be able to live. You are preparing, and this is, and as you prepare your children to live on their own, you have to prepare yourself to let go. And so the primary relationship, first principle, primary relationship is between mother and father. I remember quite a few years ago having a conversation with a gentleman who was probably in his mid-60s, but his mother-in-law was still meddling in their marriage. Maybe some of you remember that, that song, Billy Boy, Billy Boy, how old is this woman you're dating, Billy Boy, Billy Boy, she's whatever, whatever, and whatever. And when you add up all the total number, she's 85 years old. She's a young thing and cannot leave her mother, as it says. So we are preparing to let our children go. We are preparing them to be independent. We're preparing them for a marriage relationship. Secondly, marriage is to be permanent. You see, an end shall cleave to one another. I like to use the word super glue. Uh, those of you who have worked, done any woodworking, you know that if you get good joints, uh, you know, run the edge of, a, uh, of your wood through a joiner and p apply a good uh, bead of glue and then clamp it and let it uh, set, that eventually when you go to attempt to break it, it will not break at that joint. It will break somewhere else. And so in, the, the, in relationships that dissolve, there's never a clean break. And that's why God says, I, I want you, I want you to understand that you're going into a marriage relationship to make it last. Now, sometimes those don't. And sometimes there's remarriage, okay? So the one, if you're in a remarried relationship, make sure that you're emphasizing this one is going to work. I'm going to put the effort into it. 
What's the most important part of a wedding ceremony? Do you know? Now, obviously, you've got to have a, a you know, the, the, the bride and the bridegroom are, are, are there, but they're not the most important part. And yes, I mean, I have one of the best seats in the house on most of these events where I, I get to watch the bridegroom's face as the bride is walking down the aisle. You know, it's a, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great position to be in and to watch the beauty. But the most important part of a wedding ceremony are the vows. The vows are not a, a contract. They're a covenant. A contract is between two people who say, if you do, then I will do. A covenant is a, is a, a, a relationship where commitment is made before two individuals before God. God, I'm making this to the best of my ability. This is what I will do. This is a covenant. God, you are part of this relationship. Marriage is built on commitment. That's what the vows are. That's why you have witnesses. Remember what you said. It isn't based on romantic love. It's great when romantic love is there. But those of you who are married will find out that there are some days that romantic love does not appear to be there. But you stay together. Why? Because... We made a commitment before God. And we're going to work this thing through. Malachi 2.14 refers to the idea of marriage being a covenant. Thirdly, it's, it's a, an exclusive relationship. In the sense you hear it, leaving all others is part of the vows that are often included. Leaving all others, we, they became one flesh. A uh, man and a woman become one flesh. We become one. It, it's not that you lose your identity, but you work together to be, toward common goals and toward a common purpose, and so you must have conversation. The companionship must be there. What, what is it that we want? In marriage counseling with individuals, and I caution this, is to have a his and her checking account. Now, maybe it's, we share it, and, it, you know, she kind of runs. But to have this idea that, I don't know that I'm going to trust him with my money. I don't know I'm going to trust her with her money. And, and so there becomes that potential for a break. Somebody has said, the only thing that you ought to be able to have that's your own is your own bathroom. But It's ours. It's ours. And if you are thinking about getting married and you cannot do that with the person that you are contemplating marriage with, don't, don't get married. You're b building on the wrong principle. And lastly, first of all, first principle, it's primary relationship. Secondly, marriage is a permanent relationship. Thirdly, it's an exclusive relationship. And fourthly, it's an intimate relationship. Last part of verse five, uh, 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and they weren't ashamed. It isn't just physically they didn't have, everything was open. There was conversation emotionally and physically. Everything was open. And it wasn't until, remember, Genesis 3 in the fall where all of a sudden they put on clothes. They got to cover up because sin has now broken that relationship. I find it interesting as I was thinking this through. You know, what did Adam and Eve wear to their wedding ceremony? It wasn't a tux and it wasn't a wedding dress. They wore their birthday suits because it was full, open, and trust that was there. God's principles, God's blueprint for marriage. Reminder of those of us who are in marriage to reconsider, to renew, re-understand our commitments. Those of you who are contemplating marriage at some point in time, remember what is involved in that process, what God has designed you know, if, if you're here this morning and you don't have a personal relationship with God, you, you can't build a marriage just moving toward God if, if, if you're not a follower of Jesus. In fact, it's the reason why Jesus went to the cross to make it possible that every single human being might be able to know God in a personal way. That we, 
we come on equal ground. It makes no difference what our race, nationality, economic background, educational background might be. We all come as, as sinners in need of a Savior. And that Jesus went to the cross to pay for our sins and our failures. And so God desires that we would know him in a personal way. And that comes through understanding that Jesus paid for my sins and my failures. And therefore, one day when I stand before God and God should say to me, Dan, why should I let you into heaven? It's because Jesus paid my entry fee. It's not because of good works, efforts that I've done. I'll do absolutely nothing. It's Jesus paid for my sins and my failures. Secondly, to those of you married and anticipating marriage, again, consider what God's purpose is, what God wants of you, and, and invest. It takes work. It takes time. Just having a blueprint doesn't do us any good unless we use the blueprint to begin the hard work of building a house. And there'll be days you feel like building, and there'll be days you think, man, this is just plain hard work. But it's based on commitment. And thirdly, that a world around us needs truth. And a few weeks ago, I talked about taking the light that we have here and taking it out into a world because there are a lot of blueprints that are laid before people, but it starts with a personal relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you've given to us instruction. We don't have to kind of guess as to what, uh, what makes marriage work, what makes a relationship with you work. Father, we, we get bombarded that somehow religion Will, will enable us to get to you, but religion keeps us from knowing you. It keeps us from that relationship. That Jesus paid for our sins and our failures, and so everything, everything to him we owe. And so we're grateful that he was willing to do that, knowing what he got. He knew my sins and my failures, and yet he was willing to go, and that's true of every single human being. Father, thank you that you designed the relationship uh, of marriage for companionship. And Lord, I realize there's some who have not been called to that, but there are still friends that come alongside. But Father, in this world, marriage is designed by you. We don't need to update the blueprint. We don't need to change it. We need to follow it. It's given by the master architect. And Father, there's a world that's really struggling. They've been force-fed and given so much false information about what makes marriage work, what makes family work, what makes home work. And we need to be able to tell them, build your life on Christ and build your marriage on Jesus. Build your home on Christ. So thank you, Father, that you give to us truth that doesn't change no matter when we live. And so it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.